Elden Ring is a huge, sprawling game with tons to see, and while you have to look hard for the regular stuff, there are secrets beyond that. Hi folks, it's Falcon, and today on Game Ranks, 10 Easter Eggs from Elden Ring. Starting off at number 10, the many references to Berserk. The Soul series has always owed a debt of gratitude to Berserk, the incredibly influential manga written by the sadly now deceased Kentaro Muira. So much of the dark fantasy DNA of the series can be drawn back to the 1989 manga, but there are multiple things in this game that seem to be homage to that series. Starting with the most obvious, the Great Sword's design is very similar to the Dragon Slayer Sword, the iconic weapon used by Guts in the manga. Another suspiciously similar thing is the armor worn by Malaketh, the Black Blade. It looks a a lot like the Berserker armor from the titular manga. Of course, one is worn by a beast man and the other is worn by just a man, but the actual design of the armor is strikingly similar, especially the head and torso. Any fan of Berserk would have immediately noticed this last one. These prattling peg items you can use to make vocal commands look a hell of a lot like Beharit's. In Berserk, they're powerful magical objects connected to the demon world, while the prattling pates are just goofy little boxes that serve no other purpose, but their designs are clearly similar. These are the most obvious similarities, but there are a lot smaller and more subtle nods hidden in the game as well. You could practically make an entire video just comparing stuff in Elden Ring to things from Berserk, but we'll leave it at that for now. At number 9, Patches pushes you off a ledge again. Okay, so Patches is in this game, right? He's a guy that shows up at pretty much all of From's games post Demon Souls, and here he appears at a place called Murkwater Cave and ambushes you when you try to steal his chest. That's all well and good, but one thing everyone remembers about previous Patches encounters is that he'll sneak up behind you and push you down into a pit off of a cliff or something like that. Usually someplace unpleasant. So it takes a while for it to finally happen, but there is a classic Patches ambush in in this game. It takes all the way until you get to Mount Gelmir, but near the entrance of the area, there's a trail of glowing stones leading up a cliff. If you follow them, a cutscene will play where Patches does the exact same thing he's done in a million other games. He pushes you down a cliff. If you really are that gullible. The area you end up in isn't great, but at least it's pretty easy to escape from compared to previous Patches ambushes in other games. There's even more interactions you can do with Patches if you manage to get up to the Volcano Manor, and he still tries to trick you into getting yourself killed, but at this point he's pretty harmless. Go on, break a leg then. <laughs> The worst part about it is he can't attack anyone in the manor, so he can't even get revenge on this clown. Moving on to number eight, there is a Game of Thrones sword in this game. Obviously, you've probably already heard about this, but we have to mention it here. Probably the most recognizable Easter egg in the game. Uh, you find it by killing the boss of Castle Morn. The weapon, the Grafted Blade Greatsword, requires 40 strength to properly wield it, which is not something a lot of people are going to be able to do at that point in the game. But it's a weapon that is worth holding on to, because once you can actually use it, it's really a force to be reckoned with. Also, just look at it. It's crazy looking. One of the big selling points for Elden Ring was the fact that famous author George R.R. R. Martin helped outline the story of the game. If you're unaware, he's the writer of the Song of Ice and Fire books that the popular television series Game of Thrones is based off of. So it's kind of a big doy that they included an Easter egg that alludes to him. And one of the most iconic things from that show was its version of the Iron Throne, which was a throne literally made out of swords. So while the Grafted Blade Greatsword is just a sword made out of a bunch of little swords rather than, you know, a throne, it still looks pretty similar in design. I don't have any idea how much George R.R. R. Martin actually did contribute to Elden Ring, but this weapon is still a pretty great homage to maybe the defining image of his work. At number seven, the Moonlight Greatsword returns again. I mean, this is another one we've mentioned before, but it has to be brought up again because if there's one absolutely iconic weapon in the Souls series, it's this one. It's a weapon that was first introduced in the King's Field games all the way back in the PS1, and it's shown up in so many From Software games that it is hard to count. In fact, the only recent one it hasn't appeared in is Sekiro, 
Uh, but getting it in Elden Ring isn't an easy feat. You have to play through the Randy the Witch's quest to completion, which is a massive game-spanning thing that takes you through multiple secret areas, and it's more than a few steps that'll leave you scratching your head wondering, how was I supposed to figure that one out? Even when you do finally get the weapon, which is called the Dark Moon Greatsword here, the requirements may still leave you out in the cold. Even though it's a huge weapon that looks like it would require a lot of strength, it's actually that you need a lot of intelligence to use it, which seems counterintuitive, but that's kind of how it's always been for whatever reason. This is a weapon to get if you're big on, you know, from software. And even though it can be pretty tough and confusing to do, the Ranny quest line is like an awesome way to experience a lot of the biggest secrets the game has to offer. At number six, the blacksmith calls Radirica Crestfallen. This is a tiny one, but we gotta throw it out here. A weirdly specific recurring element in most of these games is you can find a Crestfallen character hanging around the hub area. In Demon Souls, it was the Crestfallen Warrior. In Dark Souls, it was the Crestfallen Warrior. In Dark Souls 2, it was Saldan. And they all have a similar attitude. They're miserable about their situation. They've basically been defeated by life. For whatever reason, the keyword Crestfallen keeps appearing. And though it's not used specifically in the game, they do throw out a little Easter egg to fans. On your way to the Stormvale Castle, you can come across this character named Roderica. She definitely fits the mold of all those other characters we've mentioned. She seems to have given up, doesn't care what happens to her. Eventually, whether you intervene or not, she'll show up at the round table hold where attitude doesn't change a whole lot. It's possible to talk to the blacksmith about her, who says that she is crestfallen and can barely swing a blade, revealing that Roderica is Elden Ring's crestfallen warrior. In the reverse to many of those other characters, though, this one doesn't actually succumb to despair. Instead, she manages to get over it and becomes one of the most useful characters in the entire game, and one of the few who never abandons the round table hold, no matter how bad things eventually get. For such a minor character, she actually ends up being one of the most memorable in the game, and her evolution through the story is a big reason why. And number five is the return of the phalanx in Noxtella. One of the common enemies in Noxtella are these annoying silver blobs called Silver Tears. In their normal state, they aren't really similar to anything, but there's one specific room where these guys ambush you, where they change things up and form shields to attack you with. If you're a longtime Souls fan, then these guys probably look a little familiar. That's because they're clearly modeled after the phalanx, the very first boss of the first Souls game, Demon Souls. What made that boss unique was how it had a small arm army of little blobs with shields surrounding its vulnerable core, so to kill it, you had to beat on all these little guys to make it easier to get to the weak spot. It's sort of a recurring thing in these games. The phalanx could also be found in Dark Souls and the Painted World. In this game, there aren't as many of them by the time you actually face them, and they're not particularly dangerous, but there's no denying these things were probably supposed to look like the phalanx. There are a bunch of blobs with a big shield. I don't know why they're hidden away in this one random room, but it's a cool little callback for old school fans either way. And number four, Patches runs away in the Radon fight when you summon him. It's another small but hilarious one. If you manage not to kill Patches at any point after first encountering him, he actually becomes a character you can call on during the big Radon boss fight. If you don't know, this fight takes place in a giant battlefield where there are summoning signs for various warriors dotted all over the place. You can call in characters like Alexander, the Warrior Jar, Blyed, the Half Wolf, along with a bunch of other helpful characters that can make this boss fight just a little bit more manageable. The one that stands out though is Patches. You call him in, but in Instead of helping you, like, at all, all Patches does is appear for a few seconds and then immediately turns tail and runs away. You know, like, like a coward. For most players, that means that you'll activate his summoning side, attempt to fight the boss, and just randomly see this message saying Patches returns to his own world after a few seconds. Uh, it's definitely in character, at very least. Just the fact that they put this little joke in such an intense fight at all is pretty funny, but it's such an intense fight that a lot of people may not even notice what's happening. Considering how tough this guy is, Patches probably had the right idea. And number three is Giza's Wheel, a weapon right out of Bloodborne. Obtained from an invader in the second floor dining hall area outside of the Volcano Manor, this weapon may look suspiciously familiar to you if you played Bloodborne. Uh, well, it's not one-to-one, -one. Giza's Wheel looks a hell of a lot like the Whirligig Saw, does it not? Its special move is even the same as the one from Bloodborne, where you can hold out the weapon and use it like a chainsaw. Of course, the Elden Ring version doesn't have the same transforming abilities that the Bloodborne weapon has, but in its saw state, the resemblance is 
is uncanny. Even the weapon description of Giza's wheel is similar to the ones from Bloodborne. It says that the design was adopted for use as the iconic weapon wielded by the Iron Virgins, which is a ridiculous name that's reminiscent of the various weapons in Bloodborne, which are said to be designed by different hunter schools, like the Whirligig Saw being used by the Powder Kegs. Like, the Whirligig Saw is just such a weird and memorable weapon, it's cool seeing it return in some form in Elden Ring, and we felt like we really had to say something about that. At number two, Executioner Smo returns. One of the most infamous boss fights in any Souls game is the Ornstein and Smo fight. And while I haven't noticed Ornstein anywhere, there's definitely a Smo wandering around the world for you to find. Found in Fort Lyed uh, on Mount Galmir, this dude looks exactly the same down to the rotund armor and gigantic weapon. He's got a little bit more of a red color theme going on, but otherwise he's nearly identical. And many of his attacks are the same too. He's got that annoying hammer charge. He does the big butt stomp. Uh, it's pretty much just Smo back for revenge. He's got a few new tricks up his sleeve to make the fight even more annoying to deal with, like where he starts spitting fireballs from the top of his head. The guy's actually a new enemy type that can be found sometimes, but every other one in the game has a set of red robes on, while this guy is all armor. He's hardly the only enemy that references another classic Souls character in Elden Ring, but he's definitely one of the most blatant. And finally, at number one, there's a place with a view that looks just like Ash Lake. Probably one of the most memorable moments for a lot of players of the original Dark Souls is when they managed to find the secret path through the Great Hollow only to end up in this mysterious location called Ash Lake. It's a place that was deep underground, but for some reason was mostly water, and all you could see in the distance were these massive trees that looked like they went on forever. It was a completely alien environment that had an almost like mythic feeling to it, like you were at the primordial roots of the world or something. And for whatever reason, it kind of just keeps showing up from games. In Bloodborne, for example, the Hunter's Dream is also a place where these weird pillars that seem to go on forever exist. If you manage to reach the CO for Underground River in Elden Ring, you know there's some pretty massive underground areas in this game, but it's not until you get to the Eternal City of Nokran that there's a view similar to the one from Ash Lake. You can see it from the Ancestral Woods checkpoint, just head north through the forest area, and look out of the ledge and there's an eerily similar view of white trees that repeat off into the distance. Now, Elden Ring is a game all about trees, like the Erd tree is kind of the central important thing of the game, so the theme makes sense, but what this view actually represents, we don't really know. Might just be a callback and nothing more, but either way, it's a pretty cool surprise for anyone who loved how the Ash Lake looked in the original Dark Souls. And as a bonus for you, some more returning enemies. Like, there's way more class or throwback enemies I noticed, so here's a quick selection of some of the more notable ones. Uh, first, the Shade Boss, which is very similar to the classic Demon Souls enemy. It attacks you by paralyzing and then grabbing you with a thing on its head, just like the Mind Flayer from Demon Souls or the Brain Sucker from Bloodborne. Next is the Red Wolf of Ragadon, which, I mean, just look at it. It looks exactly like the Grey Wolf Sith. The Red Wolf isn't quite as big and doesn't have a sword in its mouth, but obviously, Red Wolf, Grey Wolf, you're supposed to connect the two. The Erd Tree Avatar is basically the Asylum Demon from Dark Souls. Like, they pretty much have the exact same posture and moveset as well. Their design's different, but how they move and how they attack is very, very similar. And finally, the Basilisks are back. Totally unchanged and just as bad as you remember them only now they're everywhere. There's probably more basilisks in this one game than there are in the entire Dark Souls series. Why are there so many of these things? And that's all for today. Leave us a comment. Let us know what you think. If you like this video, click like. If you're not subscribed, now's a great time to do so. We upload brand new videos every day of the week. Best way to see them first is, of course, a subscription, so click subscribe. Don't forget to enable all notifications. And as always, we thank you very much for watching this video. I'm Falcon. You can follow me on Twitter at Falcon the Hero. We'll see you next time right here on Game Ranks.